This is Joel. Uh, Joel is a farmer and a restaurateur. Him and his wife Cheryl took over a farm in 2003 with no background on farming, so he's had lots of fun. And as if that wasn't enough, he also they also purchased a restaurant in Musbank called the Bent Nail, and the Bent Nail Cafe has been recognized and visited by things like the Prairie Diner, and they also incorporate some of the farm uh, farm food they grow into the restaurant, so that's cool. Um, Joel is a professional agrologist, and he's involved. He was very involved in the delivery of the Saskatchewan environmental farm plan and uh, program and watershed awareness initiative. And he's uh, very well known for his um, work as well as his chicken selfie that had over 20 likes on Facebook. <laughs> and here it goes. And like six comments too. It was a crazy <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. I'm very privileged to uh, to be here today and to be presenting with uh, Chef Mariana Brito. Um, so Mariana, she's. Um, a local and organic food advocate and chef. She was raised in Tijuana, Mexico, um, where she attended, tell me how my Spanish is, Escuela de Arte Culinario. How's that? Yeah, yeah not bad, okay. Um, before training in Spain, New York, Regina, South Carolina, and Copenhagen under Chefs with the Michelin starred restaurants, and joining her global background with a passion for organic food and her strong relationships with local producers, Mariana focuses on building community through food. And we're going to see a little video later on that will highlight that. Every ingredient is fresh, ethically sourced, and organic whenever possible. So Mariana has lived in Saskatchewan for the last six years and excited to continue to grow with the prairie landscape. She runs um, a pop-up restaurant called The Backyard and tried various um, iterations of that and still trying to find the, the, the right fit and the right mix, and I'm really excited to see where it, um, where it goes next. So the backyard right now works out of community halls and churches, hoping to shed light on underutilized kitchens and spaces. They turn these spaces into a restaurant for an evening, offering a different menu each event. Um, the menu is ingredient and vegetable driven, highlighting the local bounty and always focusing on flavor and sustainability. So yeah, and I'm just going to mention that earlier this year, Marianne I put this in her bio, but earlier this year, she was one of CBC Saskatchewan's Future 40 winners, which I think is a pretty big deal. I've only got a few more months left to get on that list, so I don't think I'm <laughs> Okay, so um, just by way of introduction, don't start timing yet because I haven't. <laughs> so we're going to be we're going to be talking about we're going to be talking about farm to table production um, and talking about both sides from the field um, area and from the kitchen. Now I'm going to assume that there's more producers here than kitchen type, although I know there are some chef kitchen type people, which is awesome. Um, well, I don't know, oh, Madison. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We have one active producer too. Okay. okay. Fantastic. So yeah, and lots of lots of producers. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but but I think it'll be very beneficial for us producers too to be hearing from the kitchen perspective as well. And so I think that'll be really good. So we're gonna do we're gonna do a tag team talk. Oh, sorry. Perspectives from both the field and the kitchen. We're gonna do a tag team presentation where we're gonna give five minutes each for we've each got a, a segment and then we'll pass it on and off. And that's mostly so that I don't just take the whole time and, and talk. So Madison is gonna time us. Each segment is gonna be five minutes, and she'll give us a one minute warning. And then at the buzzer, we'll pass the mic over. Maybe have a few seconds to finish off and pass the mic over. Something and the CBC comedy show. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Or honestly, maybe it's more of a Trump-Clinton kind of debate. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, sorry, it's not. It's not. No, no, I said, I pointed me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then we will have time for questions and discussion at the end. So please, you know, if you get time, especially if we have to cut a, a portion of our talk short because we run out of time and you want to hear more about that, then please uh, have your, you know, have those ready for the for the end. So, um, okay, so I'm up first. You can go ahead and start the timer. So. Uh, the, my question when I was preparing this was, why, why are you here? Why are people going to, to be here? And 
my answer was, well, because likely they're producers who want to get into the trendy, hip, sexy world of farm-to-table production, right? It's a, it's a really cool place to be. I mean, you know, look at this. Where all the young, cool, hip people are hanging out. Um, that or the other sessions are already full and you had to trickle in here, I'm not sure, or you just heard Marianne was going to be here and thought maybe there'd be some good food at the session. I don't know, but anyway, but hopefully there's at least, there's at least a few of you here that are, are producers who are thinking about getting into the farm to table, pasture to plate, field to fork, whatever you want to call it, world of production where you're going to get your food directly into kitchens, whether it's uh, consumers' kitchens or working directly with chefs and you want to move in that direction. So that's what we're going to be, we're going to be talking about. Hopefully at the end of the talk, you leave here thinking, yeah, that's what I want to do. However, for the first half of it at least, at least on my part, it's going to be a bit more of a cautionary tale. We'll end with some inspiration, but the first, so the first thing I want to talk about is changes to your production practice. Because no matter what you do, whether you raise pumpkins or lentils or um, beef or chickens or whatever, and you're selling into the wholesale market and you want to switch to selling directly to a chef or directly to customers, you're going to have to make some changes to your production practice. Now I can't speak across the whole realm of vegetable production and, and all that, but so just experience from my, from my own experience. So the biggest thing I had to change when I decided I wanted to get into farm to table production was that I had to move from being a typical cow-calf operator where I was selling my calves in the fall at the auction and keeping the cows over to, and to, to then keeping my, my calves for an extra year and a half after that. What I didn't realize, so I made this switch. I only kept about 10 calves over the first year. What I didn't realize was that I was moving from running basically a retreat center from, for very content middle-aged mothers who were just very happy to running a minimum security prison for delinquent, restless, teenagers <laughs> and so I spent that entire first winter patching corrals, chasing animals back in, splitting them off again and then if I was lucky doing it again three days later rather than two days later. And if I thought that was bad enough, I spent the entire summer getting phone calls from the neighbors, your cows are in my lentils, your cows are in my wheat, your cows are in my canola. So then I would be out there chasing, you know, mid-August, running through a canola field, because once your cows have already been in there, you don't want to drive through there too to put insult on the injury. So running through a canola field, and you know canola in mid-August, trying to get this group of yearlings back into the pasture. Um, so if you can picture that, you can see why I am suggesting that you consider the changes that are going to be need to be made to your production practices before you uh, before you get into it. And like maybe you won't be chasing pumpkins out of canola fields, but there's going to be some changes required when you move into this farm to table um, realm. Anyway, I became very good. Am I one minute yet or not? Quite awesome. I'm just talking really fast because I'm a little bit nervous because there's more people here than I thought there would be. Um, so I became uh, I became uh, really good at electric fencing. That was a big change in production practice that I had to do. And um, we have just our, our pasture goes right up to a lake. And so the toughest thing was they would they would go around the fence. And even if I would do electric fencing onto the water. So I had a tip from a neighbor, electric fence down to the water and then come across the shoreline. That worked fantastic. But what happened to me was I turned into kind of a mad scientist uh, farmer, just reveling in the, the thought and the anticipation of these yearlings discovering that electric fence, especially if I could get them in like knee deep water and I'd spend time watching them just to see if they could <laughs> and see how hot I could get that fence and then often became the victim of my own success inadvertently. Um, but, uh, but I never did get to see, anyway, if there's any PETA folks here, electric fence does not hurt the animals. It's, I mean, I've experienced it. It just is a good wake up in the morning. But anyway, it reminded me of a far side cartoon. Um, there's a cow sitting on the fence there and say <laughs> so anyway that's me here in the he did a pretty good rendering <laughs> just oh yeah <laughs> anyway so take home message think through the uh, changes to your production practices that are going to be needed and then I did have I had one more I'm going to end with a poem the distant hills the distant hills call to me the rolling waves seduce my heart Oh, how I want to graze in their lush valleys. Oh, how I want to run down their green slopes. Alas, I cannot. Damn the electric fence. Damn the electric fence. Thank you. <laughs> anyway. Okay, over to Marianne. That was good. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about menu planning and how that works for a farm-to-table restaurant and how we make it work. Uh, so just for you, those who you don't know that, uh, the pop-up restaurant is not, it only runs uh, intermittently, which means not every week or we don't have a set time for doing dinners. We mostly work um, as we find venues to work out of, and it's kind of complicated, and I can talk to you about that if you have questions later. Um, anyway, the first thing that I wanted to mention with the menu planning is the communication between the farmer and the producer. So with the backyard specifically, we work with around 12 small producers. Not all of them are certified, that's my dream, but um, not yet. Um, but all of them do work uh, with organic practices, and I've been to all of their farms and and that's really awesome. Um, so the communication with them, it really helps to have a fresh sheet or to have a list of things that are available every week, specifically throughout the summer, because in Saskatchewan we have some like such a like a rapid, um, specifically with vegetables, like season. So it's important for uh, the way we work to know exactly what is available. And obviously as a chef, we're always looking for obscure ingredients or like secret things that are in gardens that we could put in a plate and just uh, get excited about. Um, with the backyard, um, we've started planning our menu more like in a year vision kind of thing, instead of like planning every event as a different menu. So our menu, when we say ingredient or vegetable driven, we don't specifically do dishes or like, oh, we have a, you know, a specific names of dishes like, uh, I don't know, uh, like, um, uh, yeah, sorry? Salad. Yeah, no, but like for example, you know, like a classic dish like a penne rabiata or whatever, like uh, from that are tied to cuisines instead of ingredients. So we, when people ask me like, what is your menu? I always say like, oh, first course, lentils, right? Like that's it, we don't have a name like lentils this way or that way. It's just lentils and then we cook however I want to. Um, so, <laughs> um, so looking at the menu as a year round, it, um, it really makes you think of like, okay, spring. So spring is usually when we start our season and spring is the hardest I find. Specifically, because at the market you can not find a lot. Um, we have mushrooms year round and then there's uh, organic tomatoes by Push Brothers that are also year round and that's some greens that now we have microgreens year round as well with uh, Green Sisters Garden and like little things like that are being are able to be incorporated into the plates but preserves you want to use in the winter so spring is like let's get it let's get a little bit of freshness right so that is a big challenge like to find the greens to put in spring that was I, that's when I find the most challenging um, for the summer like well bounty is crazy and usually it's our busiest season but um, I wish that we had more time to do preservation and instead of focusing on so many the events and then be able to do more events into the winter and highlight all those preserves. Um, the fall is when we try to introduce more meat and grains. Um, but again, being in Saskatchewan, and specifically in Regina, people expect to have meat and vegetables and all the starch and the whole, like all the, um, food, the pyramid, in every plate, right? It's like how we've learned to eat. And with our four course meal, we try to really um, separate those things and like uh, find a way to nourish throughout the four courses. So something we do is we never um, repeat an ingredient throughout the four course meal, and we try to just do a different menu every time. Thank you, wow, okay. Um, the challenges with this is the learning curve for a chef or for a cook to work with ingredients that we've never worked before, specifically with me, I'm from Mexico, so uh, my approach to farming is just very recent and I've been learning about that in the last two and a half years, but in Mexico I didn't, the biggest thing I ever grew was a bean in a Gerber uh, container in <laughs> elementary school. <laughs> uh, so that's been really fun and the picture we have there um, that has to do with menu planning is that we always try to incorporate uh, Mexican ingredients into our year. So this is a called um, Papaloquelite and there's a producer up north 
that his name is Grant, and he reached out uh, like a year and a half ago and said, hey, I have some Mexican herb seeds. Would you like some? And he sent them to me. So now we grow them every year. There's three different kinds, and they're like they're they really allow us to incorporate flavors that I want to be incorporating, but because we stick so much to uh, local and organic, uh, sometimes that Mexican food is hard to um, reach. So if anybody figures out how to grow avocados or cactus, <laughs> just let me know. <laughs> Excellent. Right on. So that was the kind of both like we're trying to do this presentation so that we kind of feed off each other. So both of us talking about the, the changes to production practices there required on, on both ends. Um, so that was, yeah, that was really neat, really good. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the economics then from the field a little bit. And like my first topic, this is kind of a cautionary one. Um, I was listening to that session this morning and at the start I was feeling, you know, just a little bit, I knew I was going to be talking about economics and about how you have to make money in this, you know, and, and listening to her talk about what she was saying, I was like, oh man, now I kind of feel bad about saying you have to make money. But then she said it for me, right, part way through. She said, you, we're in a business, we have to make money in this business. And, and that's true. Um, as much as it's, it's, like I say, it's cool, it's hip, it's trendy, you feel good, you build those relationships. If you're not making money, you're not going to last in it very long. Um, and so if you want to move in the direction of, you know, selling directly to, uh, to chefs or to customers, you have to think through that the, what the difference is going to be in your economic bottom line. And the biggest thing that I realized, this is the biggest pitfall that I found in moving in this direction, was that there is what I call the myth of the middleman. And I'm going to explain this to you, wh wh how I came up with this, uh, this saying. So it happened last summer when I got two emails just like a couple weeks apart. The first email was from a kitchen manager. I don't know if he was a chef. I kind of think he was maybe the main cook or the main kitchen manager at a large cafeteria and he he sent me an email he said I'm trying to source a beef farmer to buy animals directly this is exactly out of the email cut and paste I think this would increase quality and possibly save on costs most of the wording there anyway he had 800 he said he was serving 800 meals a day and my eyes were just like wow this is exactly what I want to do like if a good consistent year-round supply that I can put my beef into and reliable source and like that would just be perfect that would be fantastic so but I hadn't yet really figured out the costing on it and, and what I would need to get. So I sat down, I crunched the numbers, um, and you know, I, have, I can say more about that, that number crunching that I did on my operation and how it came out. And he was talking in price per kg, so I had to switch everything from price per pound to price per kg. But I came out, okay, cut and wrap, delivered right to your door, $15 a kg. It was like it just bet it was between six and seven dollars a pound, was what I felt I had to get to make it realistic on my operation. And it, it just sort of set back, he said, that price is not going to work for us. Right. And and he said, I look at my current price and my average rate of use price is around eleven dollars a kg. He said, I'm sure your quality is better, but and this, but the whole original reason for this sourcing other options means was budget concerns. He changed from the first like yeah. higher quality and maybe cost savings to the whole original thing was uh, so okay. So I thought, well, it's too bad. If we could have talked more, I think you know, like if he didn't want the steaks or the roast or if he just you know, we probably could have got something compared. But anyway, it didn't work. But then just a week later, I got this email. It was forwarded from a friend. Um, he said, can you help us out with this? He said, so the price of beef has gone way up and ranchers are saying it's a scam. Retailers gouging. I wasn't my, that's not me saying that. Anyway, so whatever the case, D and I are considering buying a side of cow now. Seems worth the effort. Anyway, anyway, um, I, I thought it was interesting. I thought they used the word cow, right? I mean, I thought, well, go ahead and buy a cow. You can see what kind of meat you get. But anyway, um, but, I, but I, I, I figured out there's this thought, there's this, there's perspective that there is somewhere out there, this, in the nebulous world, world, there's this middleman that's just sitting at a computer, sitting at a desk, that's just scooping money off and not doing anything to earn it. They're just taking the money in the middle that could be shared between the producer and the consumer. And I mean, you may disagree with me on this, but that middleman doesn't exist. There are middlemen and there are middle women out there, but they're doing something. They're, they're involved in the transportation, the finishing, the processing, the distribution, the marketing, the sales. They're doing things. And so if I'm going to do directly get my food directly into kitchens, into a chef's kitchen, into a customer's kitchen, that work still needs to be done. Somebody's going to do that work. And who's going to do it? Well, it's going to be me doing it, right? And if I'm going to do that work, I'm sorry, but I'm going to get paid for it. So so people, customers need to be educated that they're going to have to expect to pay 
um, at least the same, but they're actually gonna have to pay a premium. And the reason they're gonna have to pay a premium is because whatever you say about our food system, whatever you think about it, and I got lots of things I think about our, our, our conventional industrial food system, but the one thing we can say about it, it's efficient. It is efficient, it's industrial, it's meant to be efficient. And they gain efficiencies that I'm not able to get. And so I just had this slide. This is all the things they're able to use from the cow or the steer or whatever when they butcher it. I mean, for perfume, use the fat in perfume and crayons and use the, um, the skin in gelatin and adhesives and medicines and candies and confection. And like, so they're able to use all this stuff. I can't call up a tennis racket company and say, hey, I've got some internal organs. You want to use them for making your tennis rackets? <laughs> I can't gain those efficiencies that they can. So, um, so yes, bottom line, I'll leave it up for Nicole. Let's take a picture Thank of it. You. Yeah. Um, you, I just Googled it. So anyway, bottom line is, um, you're going to get into this world. Do consider your economics because they are different and try and avoid that myth of the middleman that um, that is out there. So, okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so about economics in the kitchen or in a restaurant. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is I think um, looking at rest, you know, how you look at farmers and we look at their practices and we look at how they're growing food and all these and do we do that with restaurants? Do we actually look at their practices and what they're doing with food and where is the money going, right? Like, and I think doing that helps to find those relationships with the chef, right? Like if you have a small town, rural Saskatchewan uh, restaurant that you're th thinking of taking your food to, how do you find somebody that understands that and is not like these with their food costs or their wages cost in a restaurant? And I think the answer to that is educating the customer at the end of the day and redefining really what fine dining is. So for me, fine dining is offering high quality ingredients, offering high quality food and preparing it the most respectful way. It's detouring from fine dining being lobster and cavi caviar or things that like are so far away from us and take so much money to get in, right? So. That's the first thought about that. Uh, the way we do it with the backyard is we have a little bit of a budget per dinner kind of thing and we kind of juggle with it. Doesn't always work. I need to get better at that because I always want to buy everything I can to be able to put it in the plate and to, it's hard when we're dealing with 12 different producers to be able to offer them all a piece of every dinner, right? Like so we are able to buy our cheese and our greens and our grain and our meat and our vegetables and our, like it's, so they all come from different ones and it's really hard to make it work for everyone, but we try. Um, the other thing that we try to do, to do is also, and that maybe the producer doesn't see that, we try to pay fair wages to our cooks, which is not really happening yet because we can't offer full-time jobs yet, but once, if we ever get a restaurant, that's the plan, to be able to offer fair wages as well as keep buying directly from producers. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention about the economics and like just keeping the communication open, I think is very important when a farmer has uh, some extra product that they really need to get rid of, right? Like I drive on that a lot. Like what is like absolutely you need to get rid of? And I will put that in the menu because that way, not that I can get a cheaper price, but I can like it can prevent from it going to waste. So really I try to encourage um, asking for help on the farmer and if like there's somebody that needs help with harvest and we have a team that we can get out there and we can make a day out of it. We It's never ha it's happened once last year but I find hard to um, get the farmer to say we need help or we, we are not caught up on harvest. What can we do, right? Because then there's a whole network in the city or of restaurants that are wanting this food and a lot of the chefs that I've worked with in the city don't have the time or can't make the time to go out of farms but we do. So if we can be that little bit of a middleman and uh, get food that is going to go to waste and get it somewhere, that's great. And there's options like Carmichael Outreach, just starting there, that feeds uh, homeless people or taking it to a restaurant and then maybe able to get some money for it. Um, how much time do I have? One minute. Okay. Um, I think that's what I wanted to say. So that buys you one more minute right. in your regulations. Uh, yeah. Okay. We should talk about that later. Okay. I'm very interested. In that. Okay. <laughs>
Um, no, I just, I, I love that. We're, we're going to talk a little bit more later on about that relationship between producer and chef and um, some exciting possibilities there. And I just love that redefining fine dining. I think that's a fantastic uh, phrase. So thank you, Mariana, for, for that. So, um, so I am going to, my next section is, mm, part of my talk is the number one question I get when people find out I have a restaurant and we use products from our farm, we're using beef from our farm, we're using vegetables from our garden, we're maybe getting local eggs or something in our restaurant. The number one question I get, in fact, I was just talking to Nicole earlier on about it today, and she said, well, not quite, but more or less, are you allowed to do that? How does that work? How are, are you able to do that? What are the what are the regulations? What are the regulations around that? It's, it's, a, it's a really great question. I mean, sometimes when people ask me in the restaurant, it's a little bit annoying because I'm not really sure where they're coming from because it's like, am I allowed to use the freshest, most nutritious, most tasty products um, and support the local economy at the same time? I'm not sure where you're coming from with that question. Why wouldn't I be allowed to do that? But it is a very good question and it is, you know, um, it's, it's, so I've, I've looked into it. I have, um, I have a copy of a book that I bought by Joel Salatin um, called Everything I Want to Do with Anna's Sauce. It's this quaint little farm with the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, <laughs> stories from the world. And so anyway, I heard Joel Salatin speak a few years ago. He's a, um, an American farmer. And War Stories from the Local Food Front. That's all what it's about is that he's not allowed to do what he wants to do. So I read some of the book and then I, um, but I realized that I need to find out what the situation is in Canada and more specifically in Saskatchewan. So this is by no means the the be all and end all on what you're allowed to do, but this is just from my experience, the, the phone calls that I've made, the people that I've talked to. But what I have found, it is it is a very gray, it's a nebulous, it's a it's a difficult world. And eggs is a great example. So we were using fresh farm eggs. A teenager from our town who had 50 laying hens was a great um, job for her, part time job. And so we were doing this. And people said, well, are you allowed to do that? So well, I don't know. So the public health inspector was in one day, and so I asked him, are we allowed to do this? And he said. Uh, or no, so that was, she said, I don't know, I'll look into it. She said, actually, my hunch is that you would be able to, because they're allowed to sell them at the grocery store as long as they call them ungraded eggs. They take out the, off the carton, right? So I said, great, I'm going to put it in my menu. Fresh, local, ungraded eggs. I'm going to turn the word ungraded into a synonym for premium. We're going to go that route. So we kept using them. She said, but I'll look into it, I'll get back to you. She never did. I phoned her about a month later, um, left a message. She still never got back to me. So I said, well, okay, I'm going to keep doing it. About a year later, we had a new uh, public health inspector. So I asked him, we're using farm local eggs. Are we allowed to? He said, I don't know. I'll get back to you. He did get back to me uh, a few weeks later. And he said, no, actually, you're not. And I said, he said, they have to be from an inspected source. They have to be graded eggs in the restaurant. I said, but they can sell them at the rest. They're at the grocery store saying I'm great. And he said, well, I guess they have a higher standard for restaurants. And I said, well, I disagree. I think they have a lower standard for restaurants because I can't use the freshest, most nutritious, best tasting products out there anyway. But I didn't fight with him because he wasn't the one that made the rules. But anyway, so eggs, I guess if you're looking for eggs in restaurants, the answer would be no is what the answer that I got. Meat. Meat is interesting. And what I found digging into it is that in Saskatchewan, we are in um, a rather privileged or rather scary situation, however you want to look at it. Sorry, this is this is from the public health regulations. This is all this is about this is about it. An operator of a food facility must ensure that foods that are intended to be sold to the public are either liable under law to inspection or obtained from sources that are subject to inspection by the various level of governments, I would say. Liable under law to inspection. I have no idea what that means. Like, does that just mean that <laughs> it's open and the doors aren't locked? They can, they can come in? Like, it's subject to inspection? I don't know. And the other thing it says is that an operator must maintain up-to-date records of all sources of foods and grains. So that's one thing. If you are sourcing locally, or selling the, um, in a restaurant or whatever type of food facility, they should maintain records. So with beef right now, or meat, where it is right now, we are one of three provinces that does not require the meat itself to be inspected. So we are, in answer to the question, are you allowed to do that? Yes, we are allowed to serve beef in our restaurant. We get it processed of what's called a health license facility. So a local abattoir that has a public health inspection uh, once a year, basically there's, there's 
their facility is inspected, they have a health license, so we can use that meat then, we can sell it to the public, we can use it in our, in our restaurant. Um, however, I did want to point out that there's a 2012 Provincial Auditor report that, I won't read it all, but just basically Saskatchewan laws allow the sale of meat to customers without the meat being inspected. The last sentence there, we recommend that the government assess the risks related to uninspected meat and consider updating its regulations. So, there may be, but this is four years ago already, no changes yet, maybe something uh, coming down the, down the road. However, we have good news is that there is a in-between, between those um, local abattoirs, there's about a, over 100 of them in Saskatchewan, and the big um, federally inspected CFIA plants, there is a provincial program called the Domestic Meat Inspection Program. It's a voluntary program, cost shared between the producer and the government, and um, there's 10 different uh, places in Saskatchewan now that have done this voluntary um, inspection. This is, you can find this on the web. It's pretty easy to track down. And they have an inspector come out when they butcher, and they inspect the, the carcass, I guess, uh, uh, after after butchering. So so that's kind of a step up and that may be the direction it's going. I'm out of time, am I, Madison? All right. Six minutes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so just... Um, no, and Jean would be the better one to ask about that, but there is, as far as I know, there's no certified organic meat processing in the province. So, yeah. Um, so, answer to that question, yeah. Um, anyway, take home... Um, is oh, um, eggs? No. Oh, vegetables. They didn't talk about vegetables. Vegetables are pretty good. They said I asked two public health inspectors, and they said, you know, I said, can we use vegetables from our garden, from the farmers markets, from whatever? They said, yeah, you know, as long as you do proper storage and proper washing. And I was like, yeah, well, duh, of course. So, so we did that. Um, so vegetables are good. They didn't have a concern with any local vegetables at all. Eggs, no. Vegetables, yes. Milk, don't even think about it. Don't even ask. And uh, meat, as long as it's from a health licensed facility for now. So that's what I found and definitely take, I can take some more questions at the end. Thank you, thank you, that's awesome. Um, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the importance of education all across to the guest, to the team uh, in the kitchen and as well as the education of the producer. So, the first picture, oh, thank you. Oh, cool. So we, uh, talking about the guests, uh, something we try, we do is we inform uh, every course where the meat, the food comes from and um, we talk about the producers as well as how it's sourced. Um, and that's always something that people find interesting and we hope that they go back to the farmer's market or to the farmer's, uh, order from the farmer's table or whatever uh, way they can find to uh, support the local food movement as well um, as we try to always highlight the certified organic producers just to make sure everybody understands that we are really uh, supporting that. Um, yeah, so that's the guest, and then for we have a picture. This is an old picture, actually, and it's funny because with um, our with our food and our, our uh, backyard dinners, we don't always have uh, the same people coming to work. Uh, so it's a lot of casual work. So a lot of them will come at the beginning of the season, and then they have other things to do, and then they'll come back. So it's really nice that way. But the steady people that are right now part of the backyard is me and Madison. Madison sitting here up front with us, and uh, she helps me manage all the reservations as well as keep. Me in track and organize. <laughs> it's really good. Um, so uh, with the education here, something that I've tried to do and keep doing is going on internships and trying to learn from other restaurants that are doing things that I want to be doing. So this year I had the opportunity to go to Copenhagen uh, to do an internship at the only certified organic fine dining restaurant in the world. And I was there for four weeks and their practices and the way the relationships with producers work were amazing. They did things like have a chicken feed to give to the farmer. They had a chicken feed, they had a compost, they had also uh, recycling their wine. Like, it was crazy. And we'll talk about that if anybody has questions specifically about it. Um, I hope that our team and that 
that's something that everybody in our team can take on, like going and getting education and pursuing learning and things they're passionate about. Uh, but what we can do now and what we're trying to implement is some uh, small workshops. We're starting a composting workshop for our staff, and that's a good start at least to understand how to do that at home and how to um, be able to reduce the food waste. Um, yeah, so that's the education team. And then uh, for the producer, well, there's a picture of Jim Milton. Jim has a farm uh, called Cravestone, uh, well, has a business called Cravestone Creamery. Uh, we use all of his sheep's milk product. Uh, he has a yogurt, a pecorino cheese, um, a farm tune, and a feta cheese. And now he's in most restaurants in Regina. At least his feta cheese is in most restaurants. Uh, they're originally from Scotland, and this is one of the first producers I made a friendship with, and we've been to his farm many times. And just, it's interesting to just try to have the conversation, you know, I we I get comments a lot like, oh, well, you guys make a lot of money, or the backyard is very expensive, or things like that, right? Our first course menu is uh, $75. It includes tip and tax. So if you break down $75 of uh, local and organic food into four courses and five people to six people working from 11 in the morning till 1 o'clock at night, and feeding 30 people at Prox to be able to keep it really special. It's a lot of work. So we're not, like, the reality is we're not making a killing, but the idea of that is there, right? So trying to break that stereotype and that idea of the chef makes a lot of money or that that is very expensive, it's a really hard thing. But again, keeping the communication up and with the producer has been really helpful in that way and being able to get a break on paying the bill, but also, like, you know, sometimes I will forget to pay my bill. Carrie knows that. And she'll just text me, and I'm like, oh, shit, sorry. Uh, like, I have 12 producers, right? So, um, again, going back to that communication and that open um, channel where we can say we're struggling, you're struggling to how, what can we do, right? Or how can we make this work? Yeah. One minute? OK, well, I'm going to put what? <laughs> Um, yeah, um, well, I forgot to mention this and you were saying you wanted to hear about talking about uh, tips and uh, gratuity in restaurants and how that's been a way to support uh, hospitality staff forever, right? So in that regards, the backyard really tries a different model that is uh, dividing tips uh, equally all across from these two front. And we also encourage a lot like our front of the house and back of the house to work together to uh, do dishes or whatever we have to do instead of having just one dishwasher. Like in uh, specifically in regular restaurants, the dishwasher, the dish pit is a place where you start and you make minimum wage and you work a lot of hours. And in Regina, a lot of people in dish pits don't speak English, right? Like it's a really starting job. And um, I try to break my head how to break that a little bit and also bring some humbleness to front of the house and cooks to be like, we all do everything. And that way, we try to share as well everything. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, and when I when you said from Creamstone, right, or what is it? Creamstone, Creamstone yeah, because they sell at Regina Farmers Market yeah. too. Yeah, because like so when I said milk is right out or dairy products is usually right out, and when I was at Regina Farmers Market and I saw them selling cheese and I was like, how how do you are you allowed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they are, they are. So like that's really cool. Like um, I I forget exactly I picked her brain uh, about, you know, how they were allowed to do that, but something with the sheep's milk they were able to, so that's really cool. So that'd be the exception to, to that. It's really neat. Um, okay, so I've... Um I spent most of my time um, on the cautionary side, right? Uh, beware of the changes to your production practice. Beware of the economics. Beware of the regulations. And so this is my, my last seg uh, sort of segment. And I want to turn things around. Um, so I want to try and convince you why you should get into this farm to, farm to table world. And so I'm going to be talking about relationships. So the first one, and it kind of alludes to something that Mariana was talking about, and it's it's a story from just a, a couple weeks ago when we were first we were working on our, our talk and we were just getting to know each other. And I I thought, well, here's a chef. Maybe I can build a relationship. Where we can see what happens. And and so I said, hey, I'd like to I'd like to get you some beef, which I was going to bring some this weekend too, and I totally forgot. But I am going to get you some. <laughs> but I said, I'd like to give you a sample of our beef just so that you can you can try it. I said, what kind of what kind of cuts would you like? And she said, um, well, do you have? She in an email she. 
she said, do you have hearts and short ribs? And I sort of went, ah. Because every time I take an animal into the butcher, he says, do you want the heart, liver, tongue? And I say, well, I'll, maybe I'll keep the liver because maybe I can sell it, although my freezer's getting pretty full of liver. But the heart and the tongue, I don't, I don't think I have. So no, just take them, whatever, just keep them. And then he says, do you want the short ribs or do you just want to trim that off into ground beef? And I've never had anybody else ask me for short ribs, so I say trim it off into ground beef. But here, what, what the exciting thing was, was that it opened my eyes that if I can work with a, a, a world class, a really good good chef who knows how to make great use of things like organ meat and short ribs and, and like she was saying some of those other things that maybe I'm struggling to get rid of and she can take that and turn it into a fantastic culinary feast um, that's that's going to help me on that efficiency end right that's going to take me one step up further and then you know maybe you want the hair to make some paintbrushes out of too or something I don't know but um, <laughs> anyway but it was really it was when I got that email like I said first I was kind of hang my head but then it was like look there's possibilities here you step Establish that relationship, and it's exactly what Mariana was talking about before the possibilities that are there. But then you, you also get those relationships with people that are that are eating your food that you've produced, and that's something that we miss out in it, so much in agriculture. Is we grow the products, we put it out there into the market, and we never hear back from people. So when you get into this world, you'll hear back directly from people. So we'll cater a roast beef supper, and people will tell us, and we'll make sure we let them know this is grass-fed premium beef from our own ranch, and they'll tell us after this best beef they've ever had. And it's just is very rewarding. We I sell ground beef to this one woman, and she says she can't stand normally the, the smell of ground beef cooking. And she said when she cooks our ground beef, like she just she stands in the kitchen and just loves it. Like it tastes like food. It tastes like something she wants to eat. I had another woman tell me that she hasn't eaten steak in years because it bothers her digestive system. And she was at a party that a friends of ours were hosting. They were cooking some of our steaks, and they convinced her to try some. And she said it was delicious, fantastic, and no problems with her digestion. And that is things like that that you hear that make you feel like you're doing something good in the world, right? And, you know, like I heard that, that talk this morning and I was, I was inspired and part of me says, well, I'm not maybe doing as, she's doing awesome things and I'm really inspired to, to hear what she was doing, but it's like, I'm a little piece of that too, right? I'm a little piece of that, that food network and that sort of food revolution and it feels really, here's another quick story. We had a really tough time in our restaurant, partly because of the education of the staff that Mariana was talking about with ours of moving from using a Cisco pre-made burger <laughs> to using our own beef and our own burger. And it was it was staff who were like, yeah, Cisco makes it so easy. It's pre-made. It's just there. You just go and you do it. And, and the volumes are there and everything. And, and it's consistent and everything. And so the staff really liked it. And the customers, our Ben Nail burger was just, people loved it. They were and, they, and so when I would talk about changing it, they said, don't you dare change it. I said, yeah, but I'm going to make it better. And they said, no, it's the best. You can't make it better. So anyway, eventually, it took us two years, but eventually after running the restaurant for two years. Finally, I said, enough is enough. This is what I wanted to do when we first started. We're going to use our beef and our burgers. So came up with a recipe for doing it. Made the switch. And I don't know, it was a couple months later. I was in the restaurant helping out and uh, served a table. And uh, they had ordered some burgers, a table of regulars. That day we had run out. We were really busy. That's why I was there helping out. And we had run out of our, our burgers. So we had Cisco burgers on backup. So they, they got an old style band nail burger. And I came back to check on them after. And they just looked at me, they were just disgusted. And they just said, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, that's the same burger that you're raving, that you've been raving about for the last two years. But the, like, when we come here, we expect, this is the exact word, we expect to get a Joel burger. And <laughs> so that was not maybe as heartwarming a story, but it did, it, it really meant something to me. It was like, not only were we able to take something that they loved and make it better, we were make it, able to make it better to the extent that the previous version was the almost inedible, it was just unacceptable to them. And that was, that was really great. So if you can get to that spot in this farm to table world, getting food directly, Directly, dealing directly with chefs, getting the feedback, dealing directly with customers. Um, you get to do what you love on, on this end of things, and then you get the relationships on the others with some people in our restaurant there. So, And it, it really is very satisfying and a rarely rewarding place to be. Like I have it, but yeah. do you want to talk a bit? Okay, yeah. sounds good. Uh, we're going to play a video. Uh, we had the luck of Sastel last year reaching out to do a promotional video in the backyard. And we're going to share that with you guys today. Uh, just uh, another thing I wanted to say is... Um, just like encourage everybody to finding ways to make it work. Um, it doesn't like have to be in, like, in the restaurant. 
I want it to be entirely locally sourced and entirely organic, but uh, it takes time to get there. And I really love uh, even helping people get there. We do some consulting to help other restaurants incorporate local and organic food into their places. And it's just, it, I think it's just, we all have to work on this to be able to make it better. Um, I think there's different ways to make it work. The, there's a model of one ch producer, one chef, where that relationship is really a farm to table. So it's a restaurant that is in a farm, and then there's the farm supplies entirely the restaurant, right? So, but there needs to be a chef or a cook or somebody that loves to cook to be able to run a restaurant, and then there can be the producer. Then the other way is what we mostly do, which is one chef, many producers, and that is a bit more work. I'm not gonna lie, but it's also part of being in the city and um, trying to. Um, help the system, I don't know. And then the other option too is one producer, five chefs, so like, or six chefs, or as a producer, how do you find, we always say, you know, the Nico Snyder, the general, the director of the farmer's market, she said something to me and it's, it definitely like struck me because she said, when a small producer gets a restaurant um, like order, it's like winning the lottery, like a, like a steady restaurant order, right? And I've seen that and I just can't wait for more producers to have that a possibility and that opportunity uh, where they can have that relationship, where they can um, uh, be sure of selling something and be sure of being able to make it through the year, right? Yes. Yeah. So for me, I'm a Lego geek. Oh, that's uh, sorry. Right. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> 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 Well, and, and just before we, uh, I'm going to pass the mic around because again it's being taped and I think that's important that you get your question uh, on tape as well. I did want to point out one thing and that is that we don't have any certified organic abattoirs or whatever, but you can get a certificate of attestation, I don't know if you're aware of that, so that you can maintain the, the organic certification through the process. That allows you to continue to own your product and maintain your organic certification, and especially if you're doing the volume you are, it might be something you want to look into. But that is, that's new information, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, there you go. Um, it's, you, you find different things out when you're in the certification <laughs> business. Well, so right. anyway, there's a question yeah. here. Just, just for positive notes, anyways, uh, about, I don't know, I'm trying to think, we were in the sheep industry for 14 years anyways and lost our cheap labor in 2010 but by 2010 we had 140 ewes and we had a 10 year relationship with a restaurant in Saskatoon started out we'd send parts and pieces of, of lamb what he wanted and of course generally choice cuts but by the time we were into our seventh and eighth year we were sending whole carcass to the restaurant and he was basically using everything, making ruse, making whatever was necessary to you and making his own sausages and his the lambs that we would take up we would say you know, over the course of a year 40 lambs would go up to the restaurant three times a year he would promote Lemberg lamb and be, and same thing organic okay he's we're taking it we're taking it to our butcher he just does that he was not certified organic so we lose our certification there and then it would go up to him as raised organic lamb and it was generally on the menu for three weeks and would never make it the three weeks because they were sold out within wow. two weeks generally wow. on the That's product. Amazing. And wow. it, it worked out to be an amazing relationship. Tongue, in <laughs> about 20 years ago we were in California, went to an amazing little Mexican restaurant, very traditional, Tongue Tacos. Beef tongue tacos are amazing, so bad. Don't don't waste anything. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm a producer near Saskatoon, and I work with a few restaurants in Saskatoon. And same thing, it's it's awesome to see them. They're using the whole animal. I just get the pig or the lamb slaughtered and take them whole like that, and it it's great. And and. It's, it's mostly working, but I was wondering if you had any advice um, in terms of how you deal with the fluctuation in a restaurant because, you know, we'll plan that I'm going to deliver one pig a week for six weeks 
and then all of a sudden, oh, I need two this week. Or I didn't sell through that one, can you hold that one? But they're already booked into the butcher. So it's hard for me to, because they want them fresh. They don't want them frozen. So that's just uh, like something that I struggle with and I, I try to accommodate, but I don't know if you have any advice. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome that you're able to sell fresh uh, meat yeah, to restaurants. That's not very, uh, yeah, but it's harder with Regina. Like, Regina is not a big option yet, um, specifically for us yet. Um, I would say you should just lay the law in that way. Like, um, because as chefs, we need to get organized in that way. And if we are booking events three days before the event, that should like it doesn't work with local food. Right. <laughs> so um, just sticking to your guns. Like if the fear is to lose the contract, then like then you should probably find um, <laughs> yeah. But it's tough. But it's yeah. tough. I don't. <laughs> they, at the beginning, they were mostly running it as specials. So then it's like, okay, it's on special, and when it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. But now they're serving it, and it's actually yeah. listed on, on the menu. menu. So yeah. when the customer comes in, yeah. it's listed yeah. on the menu, and we're out. Yeah. Like that's not okay. Yeah. And yeah. then also, I understand his struggle because maybe he's planning to be busy one weekend. So then people yeah. just don't show up for some yeah. reason, and yeah. you know, it. So I understand where he's coming from, but. It's hard for me yeah. to schedule it in too when I'm relying on an outside butcher. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't. I don't really have. I don't think anything to contribute because it sounds like you have lots more experience than I do in that world too. And um, and I'm, I'm aware there's lots of producers doing lots of great things. Um, but again, yeah, diversity. Like I've often thought, like when I'm trying to sell, like so we use some in our in our restaurant. But then when I'm trying to sell to customers, I've made the mistake of saying, okay, what do you want? You know, like and just saying, and then then I run out of all this, like all my T bones will be gone or all my sirloin roasts, and I'll have all these cross rib roasts and. So so what I'm starting to do now is boxes. Like it's like you want a box of beef, okay? Fifty dollars a box of beef, you're gonna get a roast, some steaks, some ground beef, and that's what you're getting. So that I I deal with it that way. But it doesn't really speak directly to your situation. But I think yeah, it's all a process, and we need to have a big conference on just farm to table and get everybody together. And because uh, the more chefs you have and the more options you have out there, the better it's gonna be. So. I think we have time for just one more question. So what about ramping up? Like, say if you want to get into this, um, you don't want to grow enough for a year's supply for a restaurant, for a something, and then hope you can sell it. At the same time, if you want to start selling to somebody and you only have a little bit, and they say, that's great, but we need more, so we're going to look someplace else. Like, how do you deal with that process of ramping up? I didn't realize the question would be so hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, yeah, it's tough. When I got that email from the, the cafeteria guy, they, I had to tell them, I had to say, I don't have the animals ready right now. Like, I don't, like, and, and the thing is with ramping up with, with calves, like, it's like two years, right, before you, before you get there. And so you slowly try and get into it. And that's where I think if you could find some connections and work with, work with people and, you know, have other producers on board as well too, but yeah, I don't. I don't really have any great answer. I, I went slow, like I did ten animals, and then I actually I think I had to back off to five animals next year. And then now I've got twenty coming up, but I'm in that same boat where it's okay. I got twenty for next, you know, next spring, and we'll we'll see what'll happen. So I'm trying to trying to get it all figured out before then. But yeah, it's a it's a tough thing to do, especially with animals, because it takes it takes a long time to to get them there. But do you have thoughts? Yeah, I don't know. I was thinking if. Carrie would know how to answer that question. Carrie supplies two restaurants in Regina Greens, and it, like that fluctuation, I'm sure it's like very common. Me specifically, we're so small that um, I've been growing with the producers, like with specifically with Jim uh, from the Sheep's Milk Farm as well. Um, like he's been pumping up his production that other restaurants want, but I don't know what's going to happen when more restaurants want. Right? Like then that's where competition really is need to come into place, and more people need to get into. Uh, supplying restaurants, I think. But, yeah. Do you have a comment on Um 
so I'm Carrie from Green Sister Gardens. I grow a lot of um, greens and stuff for restaurants. So like the first year I started out just supplying the farmer's market because you kind of get an idea of like your production and how to do it. And then in the later years, I've been doing it five years now, um, I've kind of just slowly introduced it to restaurants. And I, I target restaurants with chefs. And I kind of build a relationship with them so they understand how my farm works and like how I have stuff ready. And um, so, I mean, it's different than animals. I don't understand that part of it. But with my greens, it's just, it's really building relationships with people so that, you know, Mariana understands like how my, my stuff works. And like, it's good to have, um, I don't know how to say it. Someone said it really well to me one time, but it's, to, <laughs> this might sound bad, it's it, to keep the chefs a little bit hungry. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> that sounds terrible, but <laughs> like, but if I have an overabundance of stuff and I'm right. throwing it in the compost, yeah. I'm throwing yeah. away profit, you know? Yeah. Like, so I, I try and keep it at a level where I think I can sell it, but I'm actually just trying to keep it slightly under, yeah. right? So, yeah. you know, I could still supply the majority of yeah. the restaurants, but I might be a little bit short. But it also keeps them interested, and they, you know, like I'm not trying to play a game. I'm just trying to kind of find that balance so that, yeah, I'm not composting a bunch of stuff and losing money. Yeah, yeah. and grow slowly. Like yeah. grow slowly has like I started out way too big. I, yeah. I failed at everything, yeah. you know. Like yeah. so, that would be my best advice: is just kind of ramp that. up slowly yeah. and figure it out as you go. Grow slowly and keep keep them hungry, keep them wanting more, and then build yeah. up to the yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds pretty solid. Mm -hmm. yeah.